Hello and welcome to Pet Talk with me and Teddy. Teddy is saying hello. Hello to our wonderful guest, Amber Batson. Hello, Amber. Hi. Thank you so, so much for joining us on Pet Talk again. And um, particularly because this is a time of year that we all know can be extremely stressful to many dogs. And of course, we're talking about fireworks. Yes, absolutely. A scary time, isn't it? Both for owners and pets. Um, and let's not forget the cats, the rabbits, the horses too. Um, so often affected by fireworks, exactly. So um, delighted to have a chat with you about it to try and help as many dogs and other animals as we can leading up to the next few weeks of noise. So to start off, perhaps it might be worth understanding why it is that some animals seem fine with it and some aren't? Well, that's a really good question. And um, I don't think we always know exactly the answer, but there are, there are a number of reasons why an individual might find them scary. You know, it can be that when they were young, uh, they never got used to certain kinds of noises. And the first time they happened to hear um, these really intense loud sounds which we must remember when we hear a firework it doesn't sound the same to us as it does to other animals because other animals have got hearing outside our range of hearing so it may sound kind of the pitch even the volume potentially might sound different to different animals so maybe they've not heard that sort of intensity of sound, that type of pitch of sound before. And if it happens at a time when they're an adolescent and they're going through a bit of a kind of reactive, scary time anyway, or they're still in puppyhood, or if it happens at a time when they've got some pain in their body, you know, maybe they've got an ear infection, maybe they've hurt their neck a bit out on a walk. Um, as they tense and they hear the sound, that can trigger a real pain response because obviously you know yourself if you've hurt your neck and then you <gasps> jump, oh gosh, it hurts. So if they've got some pain in their body and this is one of the first times they hear that and then react, then they're going to make an association with loud noises and pain. You know, so loud noises can be scary. Loud noises can even be painful. Um, and, and with with younger animals in particular, we see it with children a lot as well. Children are way more sensitive to loud noises. You wouldn't take your child to a, an adult fireworks display, or you shouldn't, without putting ear protection on them. Yeah, because we know that the intensity of the sound can is picked up easier by that developing ear. So when we think about young dogs, puppies, adolescents, um, maybe you know they hear it even greater than than older dogs. But interestingly, one study did show that uh, when they did a review of lots and lots of dogs in particular that were, were fearful of fireworks, that actually the majority of them hadn't shown a problem as puppies, as young dogs. And some had, definitely, but the majority had actually started to develop it as adults. And that led um, on to an investigation of those adults and a lot of those adults were found to have some pain somewhere in their body. You know, um, and one of the other things that we know can affect our fear responses too is our gut health. So if our gut isn't healthy, then that affects the bugs that are in our gut. The bugs produce chemicals which influence our brain's reactions. And I know that might sound crazy, but it's a truth. So if we're in a period where our guts aren't particularly healthy, when we hear those loud noises, it may be another sort of re underlying reason why an individual becomes sensitive to it. You know? So lots of reasons. And you know, we, but, but equally at the same time, they all have the same sort of outcome, which ultimately is a fear, whether it's fear of pain or a fear of a weird sensation or just a fear because I've never heard that before. We are getting the same fear response out of the majority of them. Do you know, I hadn't even thought about the association of actual physical pain with the noise, but it makes so much sense mm -hmm. that if you're experiencing pain in a particular moment and that then is coupled with this huge bang that there's then an association that that's built and I also I you know the thing that's always um concerned me is this prospect that it's so random that your dog could be fine and then suddenly at the age of seven he's not and and that's 
that's made me very conscious of this because thankfully touch wood, Teddy to this day has been fine with fireworks. Um, you know, he's fine with the, he's not fine with lots of other things like car doors slamming in front of the house. He's not fine about that. He hates it. But fireworks, thankfully, date have been fine. It's so, but I'm always conscious that that could change at any moment. And I don't know why. So now you've given me um, a, a good idea. So what would you suggest um, we do to help those who are already suffering. I, I tell his friends, I've got several of, of his friends who are absolutely petrified um, during you know, firework nights, et cetera. So what would you recommend? Yeah, and I think so. it's obviously, it's a separate discussion, isn't it? Kind of fixing them, you know, trying to resolve it for the future. Um, and now when we're in weeks, you're heading into, in the United Kingdom, at least anyway, you know, we, in many parts of Europe, we're maybe a week off the majority of fireworks displays starting. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not gonna be able to fix those problems now. So it's how do we get through this period of time? And then I absolutely urge you, and I'm sure I'll come back to it later, please then don't just forget about it all until, you know, sometime after New Year, where you now think, oh, I've got eight or nine months without worrying about it again, because that's the time when we do have the opportunity to really do something about it. So kind of there are, I think there are two things that we need to consider really. There's kind of the preparation, you know, kind of now, what can we be doing now, today, when there's no fireworks happening that would start helping get ready? And then there's what can we do when the bangs themselves actually start or on an evening when you know there's going to be a fireworks display. There's those two elements on there really. So one thing that we can do now um, very first thing that I need everybody to do is to make sure your microchip dates details are up to date. Yeah, so your dog by law in the United Kingdom has to have a microchip. Make sure that you know you can access your data online um, or call the company, contact the company, and check your details up to date. So common in veterinary practice um, that we as vets and nurses and staff get people bringing the animals that have been found and we scan them, we find the chip and then the phone number doesn't work and there's no email attached to it you know and so if our dog or cat you know gets scared or even horse gets scared um you know during fireworks um, and then and they escape we've got a better opportunity of getting them back you know so that's really important um, and secondly then is if you have an animal with an intense fear response go and speak to your vet now don't delay any longer because even with COVID-19 still around and complications in veterinary practice, um, because of everyone being so busy, uh, it may well be that they would like you to bring the animal in for a weight check and to check their heart. Because later on, we'll talk about medicines briefly. Um, and you know there are a lot of medicines that we could give that might mean that we want to make sure their heart and their circulation system is functioning properly before we dispense that medicine. You know, so if you've got an animal that you know has a really, really tough time, please don't think, you know, oh, yeah, but I don't want to give them drugs. Um, and I will talk about drugs when we talk about fireworks night itself as to why they're helpful. It's not just about doping them so that they don't, you know, recognize them or making them immobile and yet they're still scared. We've got lots and lots of medicines now which work in very different ways. They reduce the fear response in the brain. And you know, a couple of studies which are showing you know, that these animals do produce less stress chemistry, their heart rate's more stable. So you know, they can be really, really beneficial. So you know, check your chip. And if you've got an animal with a more intense fear as you perceive it, then, then please contact your vet now and, and see if you need an appointment to get a weight check and a heart check before they'd consider sending you any or, or dispensing you any medicine. Then it's about routine, really. You know, now is a good time to start making some routine changes to make sure that a routine change on the night isn't a source of stress in its own right. You know, a lot of animals do start to get a bit wary around this time if they've had a history of fireworks issues because they know the day's shortening means 
the thing that this is likely to happen. Animals are that good at looking for predictors. You know, so let's make sure that we don't kind of create stress by suddenly changing a routine. Think about just shifting your walk a little bit earlier in the day. You know, or maybe if you can, changing your walk time so that it's a lot earlier in the day. And instead of going for a walk when you get home from work, perhaps at five, six o'clock, what you're actually going to do is do some puzzle toys with them in the house, you know, and then then you could always, if necessary, go for another walk much later in the evening, which on a fireworks night you may have to skip, you know, depending on, on the, pres the uh, display that's near you. But just start making that shift now. Just start walking them maybe 15 minutes earlier than normal if you can, or taking them at lunchtime if you work till later, and then doing some puzzle toys or something in the evening. Puzzle toys, and, and so this is going to be one of my things about the night, but what we want is we want dogs to be in a calm state before the fireworks start. So some people sometimes think it's a good idea to go and take their dog for an intense, fast exercise before the fireworks to tire them out. But actually, we know that the chemicals that, and hormones that animals produce in fast exercise are stress chemistry that switch on the reactivity of the brain. So actually, the concept of tiring them out probably isn't going to help. Yeah? So what we want to do is we want to make sure that walk that we're doing now leading up to fireworks becomes a lot more sniffy, a lot more relaxed. Yeah? And it doesn't mean to say if they want to run around, it doesn't mean to say you can't let them off their lead and they can have you know, some bursts of activity, but don't go out with the intention of exhausting them. You know, don't go to the dog park and ball throw and ball throw and ball throw or meet up with other dogs that you know they charge around for 20, 30 minutes or take them jogging or cycling. You know, by all means, take them somewhere where you can let them off. And if they want to have a bit of a faster run around, that's voluntary and choice, their choice. But then encourage them then after that, after five, 10 minutes of that to, hey, let's walk by some trees. Let's walk by some lampposts. Let's walk by down a different street so that there's lots and lots of interesting sniffy things for them to do. Because what we want is we want them to come home full of karma chemicals, not full of stressful excitatory chemicals. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because the, the last thing you want, what you want is you want to, your dog to be soothed and calm because they're going to start pumping adrenaline exactly. the minute those fireworks go off. Yeah. So you don't want them already hyped up on adrenaline um, coming in. Um, so it makes complete sense that you would do, and, and you said, you know, lots of sniffing, which we know is a very calming thing for dogs. So perhaps, you know, take a few little treats for them to, to find while they're, they're out, you know, encouraging them to forage would be much better than ball throwing because that hypes them up. It's, it's the adrenaline, the excitement again. Mm -hmm. So yes, that makes complete sense. That, that sounds really good. Um, is there I don't understand why people think that though? I just want to say if people have been doing that before, if you've been, if you have gone out and you've been ball throwing or you're doing fast exercise with the intent of tiring your dog out, then you know, or, or horse, of course, as well. Some people will lunge their horse intensely before fireworks because they think that might actually make them more sleepy. Um, you know, it's it's just once you've got that information and you have that understanding, it can change how we do. We've all been there, we've all done those sorts of things. I've done it myself. You know, so it's not a judgment. It's just that uh, we have this knowledge now. We know those kinds of intense exercise for animals like dogs and horses cause that stress chemistry release, which includes adrenaline, also includes cortisol and other stress chemicals that last longer in the body. They can last hours for animals. So if they're already full of them by the time they come home from their exercise or back to the yard from their exercise, that's going to just perpetuate, make it easier for those levels to rise when the first firework goes off. Is there anything that we can do for cats in preparation as well? Yeah, so again, the same thing with cats. If we think about the routine change, what we might want to start doing now is two things really importantly. We might want to start calling them in a little bit earlier for a tasty meal, you know, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of fish, um, you know, just a spoonful so that they want to come in, you know, at the time that's ready. So that on the nights, you're not panicking, cat's not back in yet. Get them used to coming in and make it worth their while. It's going to be tasty. It's going to be yummy. And we're going to actually shut the cat flap, you know, for 
an hour or two in preparation. You know, maybe in a week still leading up. Um, you know, depends when you launch this, when this video. But you know, if we are several days, you know, maybe you don't have to start locking them in for hours and hours on those first few nights, but at least get them to come in, have something yummy, stay in for an hour or two, and then let them back out. Because on the night before, the night of the nearest displays to you, you're definitely going to want to call them in. And then you're going to want to shut the cat flap. You want to make sure all your windows are shut, of course, because otherwise cats will find a way some out somewhere else as well. Um, and you might also want to think about a litter tray, because for a lot of owners, depending on where you are with the display, you might be thinking about calling your cat in at four o'clock, ready in, in preparation, maybe even a bit earlier for some of us. Um, and then maybe you're not going to be able to let them back out you know, because maybe the fireworks are going to go on till 11 or 12 o'clock. Um, and so they're going to need access to the loo. So put a litter tray somewhere. And if your cat's not used to using a litter tray, then you might be better off actually putting some soil in it rather than cat litter. And I know that sounds a bit crazy, um, but it's about what does your cat normally go to the toilet on? If you suddenly expect your cat to use kind of, you know, shredded paper or clay pellets or something like that, wood pellets, and they've not used that, you know, since they were tiny or ever, then they're probably not going to want to use it. You know, but actually soil from outside, you know, they're far more likely to, to be inclined. And you might want to think about where to put that as well. I'm afraid that's quite variable cat to cat, but probably not by the back door you know, actually, because if it's noisy outside, they're probably not going to want to go to that place to go to the loo. They're probably more likely to want to go somewhere quiet, you know, so it's just important that maybe it's in a room where you are all going to sit together and it's in a quiet place, you know, kind of near when um, not too much is going to be happening, you know, so, so some, some good things you can do for a cat. And of course, there are medicines for cats too. You've got a cat that's really terrified. Um, so the whole thing about check the chip, if they're chipped, if they're not, should they be chipped? Yes, probably, um, you know, maybe get them checked by the vet if necessary so that we can think about using medicine for them as well. And, and in preparation for that, my top tip with owners giving cats medicine is to go to a supermarket and buy, um, you can get little glass jars of uh, paste. It's called sandwich paste quite often. And um, it's a very sticky meat fish paste and um, just check it's got no onion in it I, I don't hardly ever come across any that have onion in but we mustn't give onion to cats um, and why do I like that more than pate or butter or cream cheese because as far as I'm concerned it's one of the stickiest sub, uh, stickiest substrates known to man basically so what I say to cat owners is get one of these um, and you can keep it in the fridge and it lasts quite a while just take out a pea-sized amount and put it on, not on their bowl, but on a plate or a mat or something as a treat. And you'll find that they'll, they'll sniff it, they'll lick it, and maybe they'll like it, it'll stick to their tongue, they'll probably eat it. Practice that a few days in a row, just one or two treats per day on their mat, you know, or on a plate separate to their bowl, so that they think that this is a great treat. And then once they've practiced it a few times, when you need to give them medicine, and this is relevant whether it's a cat wormer or medicine for a disease or it's medicine as an anti-anxiety for fireworks, what you can do is you can take two pea-sized amounts, yeah, and you give them the first one, which is just their normal treat, and then you give a second one, which is coating the tablet, and you just put it on their plate or their mat exactly like you do. And because they're expecting to, to take this thing, which they know is sticky, so they just tend to pick it up and swallow it really quickly, then they probably won't notice the medicines there. You know? So many owners over the years who've come to me and said, there's no way my cat's gonna take tablets. I would say 95% of owners, I have been able to get their cats to take tablets like that. There are still a small percentage that we can't, but the majority will. And that's something you can practice now, um, whether you're gonna use medicine for fireworks or whether you just want to do that for something like worming in the future. Once they've got good at it, you only need to do it once a week. Just have a practice once a week, you know, so that they always have in their mind or when that treat comes out on that plate, I should just pick it up and swallow it without thinking about it because otherwise it's really sticky, you know. And, uh, you know, that, that's a really good thing you can do for cats. So, you know, um, I think yeah, that's probably that's just covered all the kind of basics for preparing for cats, really. And actually, one of the 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 important things about doing this with cats is if your cat is used to being able to roam whenever it wants to, um, getting just getting it used to the idea that actually they're not going to go straight out after they've eaten. Exactly. 
Um, it gives them time to get used to that idea. Other, because the last thing you want is to have them in upset with fireworks going on. Because now they're upset about two things. They, they feel trapped indoors and outside sounds like a war zone. So it's, it's a terrible predicament, you know, for everyone to be in. So it's a good idea sometimes when they when they've come in and they've had their tasty thing, you can do a little treat hunt, you know, in the house for cats, you can get dried bits of fish or chicken or other things that your cat likes and, and hide little bits and say hide, you know, in case the cat doesn't find them, put them places you know where you put them. <laughs> um, or you have a dog to clear up after them, maybe. But you see, so and you know, all some just real simple little puzzles, you know, drop a few of their favourite treats in some scrunched up pieces of recycling you know, or toilet rolls, you know, take a toilet roll and put one in the middle and then just pinch the ends a little bit or get a box, um, you know, and put lots of toilet rolls in it and maybe cut some of them in half and drop little tiny bits in a few of them. So the cat's got to put their paw in to fish them out. So if they get used to this idea that they come in for their tasty thing, they notice that the cat flap is shut, but now they're going to do something fun like a treasure hunt or puzzles then you know they're not so frustrated that they can't go out immediately afterwards and absolutely they, you know, that makes a big difference for cats obviously cats are different to dogs and when cats get really scared they they want to go up you know, they are what we call a vertical flight animal because in the wild they will go up trees as we've all heard so you know um, think about where has your cat got where they can get up easily onto and of course, as cats get older, as soon as they're over the age of three, four, five years of age, a lot of cats have got some degree of arthritis, even if you don't know about it. It's really common. Um, and so and cats have to work quite hard sometimes to get up onto things that they used to find super easy and they can do it, but it might be uncomfortable for them or it might be a bit stressful for them. So think about can they hop up onto a little table before they hop up onto you know, the top of the wardrobe or the back of the sofa? You know, make sure it's made easy for them and that they've got a choice and a really easy thing to do if you don't because you don't have this interaction with your cat the rest of the year is just get a big cardboard box and cut a hole in it a u-shape in it and cover it with a towel so it doesn't move quite as easily and then if they want to go into something to hide you've got a ready-made hidey place for them without spending hardly any money at all hopefully it was free you know, and, and you can put that somewhere so that they've got something to hide in, but it wants to be up, you know, and whereas dogs are different, you know, dogs, some dogs want to go up when they're scared. They remember that part of their evolution too, um, and they do want to go up. That's why some dogs want to go on the back of the sofa. They want to climb up on you. They want to be up on the bed, you know, so we want to provide them with some elevated surfaces, but it's not going to be the same height as our cats. <laughs> cats really want to be right up whereas dogs tend to be kind of middle of the, of the room. And so there's this thing about uh, this myth. Is it a myth? Is it not a myth about dens and dogs? And absolutely, when we look at most free ranging studies, most dogs don't den. They only den when they're giving birth to puppies, that they create themselves a little kind of confined space. But that doesn't mean to say when they're really, really scared that they don't want to go and stick their head in something and hide away. Yeah, that's a different thing. They might not den on a daily basis for sleeping and shelter, but they might want to hide in something when they're scared. Different dogs have different strategies, just like humans. Some want to be up, you know, and really, really vigilant. Some want to go under and close their eyes and hide. And some of them just want to keep moving. You know, they just want to keep pacing and pacing and pacing. And so it's very much about know your dog and allow them choices. And then certainly don't restrict their choices. Don't think, oh, well, I know they like to hide. What I'll do is I'll shut them in. You know, by all means, provide the thing that you think they want to hide in. You sit near it, but leave the door open. You know, leave the space open for them, whether it's you've covered the coffee table, whether it's a crate, whether it's under your bed. If they want to go under, they're fine, but let's not shut them in that space because sometimes actually they want to come out and just check everything out. And now maybe they want to go up on something, you know, so... Just make sure we bear that in mind with our dogs. It was interesting you said um, give them what they want, but then be with them. This is not a night to go out, is it? And leaving them in. 
No, exactly. And I, I know that's tricky because many of us want to go out and watch the fireworks. But if we've got a dog who we know is going to be fearful of fireworks, then, you know, then, then we've got two options. What we can do, there are two options with dogs. Uh, you know, we can stay home with them and that can be brilliant. But you know what works brilliant for some dog owners is we put them in a car and we drive and we drive because sometimes being in the house where it's so loud, if you're close to a, a display can be really, really awful. Whereas if your dog's actually okay about travel, putting them into you know, their, their travel space, the boot of the car or whatever it's that's safe for them in, when they're traveling by law and driving away might give you the opportunity to actually enjoy the sight of the fireworks because you can park up somewhere miles away on a hill where you can see all these beautiful fireworks, but you can't hear anything and you can have the radio on in the car, which just masks any kind of in the distance pops as well. And I know if you live in a city, maybe that can be a little bit harder than if you live on the periphery of a city or a town or rurally. But, you know, it's just something to consider that works really, really well for some people and gives the people the opportunity to see the beautiful fireworks, you know, without actually, you know, um, losing out on that. You know? So we might want to stay home with our dogs. A lot of us probably will want to do that. Um, but some of us might want to go out with our dog. You know, and there's absolutely no reason not to do that. Just remember safety. You know, what you don't want to be doing is coming out and your neighbour set off a display. So make sure your dog is securely on a long line that you've got hold of when you go to your car. Um, you know, if you're going to travel them on the night of fireworks, we do need to be super careful about that, obviously. It's just for some people, if they live near a loud display, driving away from it for, for those two or three hours um, can be a, a, you know, a much better thing to do. Maybe think about, can you go and visit someone who's an hour's drive away who you know doesn't have a display near them, you know, or, or something along those lines. But yeah, absolutely. This is, no, we want to, social contact um, is really important. So when we go back to preparing, another thing that you can start doing over the next week or so um, is you've made your walk a bit earlier or you've been doing your puzzle toys. And then if your dog likes it, just sit down on the floor and do a little bit of gentle scratching, a little or a little bit of stroking, or a bit of grooming, you know, or perhaps even just a gentle bit of very superficial light massage. Doesn't matter, you don't know what you're doing, as long as they enjoy it. If they enjoy that kind of touch, then do that for them. If they enjoy being rubbed off by a towel, get a towel, lay it over their back, and just rub the towel a little bit. Now, if that makes them go crazy because they grab the towel and start bouncing around, that's not what we want. What we want is a social interaction between you and the dog to boost a really, really valuable anti-stress hormone in the body called oxytocin. If we can load the body with oxytocin before the fireworks start, then actually that will help bring their stress levels down a lot more. Well, at least we hope so anyway. It has the potential to do that. So have a bit of a bonding exercise, you know, on you know, every night leading up to the event for five, 10, 15 minutes. And as that finishes, you know, if, if you, you need to get on with your cooking, you need to get on with something else, make it a positive thing as it finishes, drop a few treats on the floor, give them their favorite toy to play with, give them a chew, give them a lick mat, so that, you know, you removing your attention isn't a negative for them, you know, we want them to keep thinking this is positive going towards fireworks. Um, or if you've got the time, you know, then just sit with them and then let them decide where they want to be. Do they want to lie on your lap? Do they want to lie near you? Do they want to go to their own space? So you get an idea on the night what they're likely to want to do, but you're still there for them. One of the biggest myths that we're finally getting rid of in the dog world is that, you know, the myth is, don't uh, reassure a fearful animal because you're reinforcing their fear, which is nonsense, you know? And again, that's an, and I don't mean that in a judgmental way. I've been there too. I was taught that 25, 30 years ago. I believe that too, um, but we know it's not true. And it's based on the way that our chemistry and our body works. If you are fearful and you have someone who's familiar to you, you know, your human caregiver, um, and they are present when something scary has happened, we know that the fear and stress response is actually lower in that individual, not greater. So you're not making the fear worse. You're not making the barking worse, the pacing worse, the digging behaviors worse. You know, at, even if they don't get better, you're not making them worse. You know, so just be there as an option. 
that's the important thing so that you know the dog knows that they can come to you or that they do enjoy this massage every night and we're going to do it um, because social contact really really matters you were talking about um, puzzle games um, earlier. Um, is that something that might be beneficial to some dogs? Because I know that if, they, if they're very afraid, it's less likely they're going to want to engage. It's harder to distract them once they get over a certain threshold of yeah, fear. Absolutely. But if you have a dog that's just mildly uncomfortable, would you, would, I think that, that might be helpful. Is that what you're you're saying? Yeah, exactly. So on the night itself, so the things we've done in preparation, we're preparing for the night by shifting our walking pattern or our cat coming in pattern, you know, or um, and as well, you know, then we're just thinking about doing some calmer exercise, calmer activities that are pleasurable but calm with them, and hopefully, you know, cat or dog then we're providing them with, a, with an additional bit of social contact each evening leading up to the event. But on the night of the event itself, it's unlikely for the majority of dogs that they are going to be distracted by something. Even their most favorite toy or chew or yummy thing is going to be put in a box by their brain because their brain says, I've got to pay attention to this scary stuff. You know, so when we are when we're doing this preparation and we're doing some puzzle solving etc it's to get them used to that routine so that on that night they approach that night of the display already in that calm state if they are of an individual who still wants to do the puzzle solving or the chew or the lick mat while the display is on brilliant if they don't want to do that thing, if they take one look at it and you can see they're a bit more tense, their ears are a little bit further back, their tail's a bit more lowered, whatever it is that your dog starts to display when they're in the earlier stages of fear, then you can leave it out, but we're not trying to give it to them because it's not gonna work. It's like when they come to the vets, the majority of dogs won't actually take treats, you know, or cats. Uh, cats take treats at the vets yeah they do um but you know a lot of them don't because their fear is too high and partly it's because the brain goes into this situation where it ne it shifts when it thinks it needs to run away or hide and it's got to deal with fear it moves the blood that's around the gut into the muscles so in fact the brain is told by the gut don't eat because we don't want food sitting in our gut that we can't do anything with that food. It's not healthy, it's not good for us. So there is a switch off of appetite for a lot of animals where, like you say, when they cross a threshold of fear. And then now we're into talking to them quietly, stroking them if they want to be stroked. We're not trying to restrain them. We're not trying to hug them. We're not trying to scratch them, you know, in a way that, that they will calm down. You know, it's just providing our reassurance. We're here. And sometimes sitting on the floor is a better place than on a chair. But if your dog likes to get on the chair and be next to you, then that's fantastic. And, you know, it doesn't, it's up to your dog or your cat where they would like to be and provide your reassurance. If you've got an animal who actually seems to want to hide away from you, then maybe just think about putting an item of clothing that you've worn at a calm time, you know, like your pajama top that you sleep in or a jumper that you tend to wear when you snuggle down for a night rather than your gym clothes, which are full of sweat and adrenaline and are picked up by animals. Calm, ca calm state clothing can be just put near where they are so that at least they have got your smell there as well. You know, and, and then that gives them a little bit more choice. If they wanna move away from it, they can. They wanna be near it, they can, even if they don't want to be by us. You know, and why might they not want to be by us? Well, maybe sometimes they're a bit nervous because of things we've done in the past. Maybe just for some individuals, they just they just want to be by themselves so they can focus on themselves and their response to this scary noise. Some of us are like that, aren't we? You know, we just feel a little bit like I know I want to know you're here, but I want my own space. And it's that difference between where am I within my space so that I know how I can respond if I want to. I have choice. You know, and that that's so important to them. So we have some idea about what to do about dogs on the night and cats on the night. What about horses? Yeah, horses, horses are very variable, I think. I mean, obviously, one of the first things you want to do, whether you're a dog, cat or horse owner, is to check out your local displays. 
you know, find out when the big ones are going to be. So at least you're prepared for that particular, you know, night. The, the laws are a little bit more um, considerate, perhaps, of horses, although how well that gets followed through can vary from kind of county to county, certainly in the UK. Um, in that, you know, people aren't actually supposed to um, have, hold displays directly next to livestock and horses fall into that category. You know, so check out where your displays are. And they're certainly supposed to let any livestock owners know so they have the potential of moving them to a different field, etc. It's a bit harder if you have horses, you know, you've only got maybe a couple of stables or a barn and a shelter and a paddock. You can't move them like a farmer might be able to to the other side of the farm. But check out where your local displays are, what nights, what times they're going to start so that you are more prepared for those bigger evenings. Check out with your neighbours, you know, whether you're in a house or whether you're a yard with a horse or a field, check out with the people around them. You know, now is a really good time to pop notes through the door with your mobile number on, something like that. Please let me know if you're going to have fireworks so that I can be there for my horse. And then what you might want to be doing, again, if you know your horse has had really strong responses, there are anti-fear medicines for horses too. Um, so you might want to talk to your, um, to your equine vet about that in advance if necessary. But again, think about what does your horse tend to do and what's going to be safest? So some horses are better off out in fields because actually they like to be in the middle of an open space and they'll stand quite still and you know, observe and being able to make choices makes them feel better. But some horses, when they're in a big space like that, will just gallop through anything. You know, and I've had horses that have run through fences and gates and cut themselves open terribly in things like fireworks. So if that's the situation, obviously leaving them in a field where they might break through a gate or fencing is not going to be appropriate. They're not going to feel safer by bringing them into a stable, but they may be physically safer. You know, and this is the big thing about fireworks. We've got to address both elements, physical safety, will they harm themselves and emotional safety? And one isn't more important than the other, you know, which is why we have to try and address both. With horses, physical safety, of course, just as important as emotional safety. And if you think that, well, they're not going to be able to jump out of their stable or smash their way out, then maybe they might be better in a more confined, solid place rather than a field where they might be able to, to break out of fencing. Um, but you know what nights these are going to be because you've checked it out, then you want to be there. You know, again, this is not a time to leave those horses because you need to know what their responses are. You need to know that that horse isn't trying to jump out over the stable door and has got himself caught up and hanging by his back legs over the door. Or actually, he has managed to smash his way out through a gate or a door and is now running around. So inconvenient though it may be, really important, at least one person is going to be present on the yard for the display itself so that we know what the reactions are of those animals. And horses are big animals. When they get fearful, they can do us a lot of damage, more so than most dogs and cats can. So we probably don't necessarily want to be in the stable with them if they're in a confined space. Um, you know, we just want to be outside and read a book, you know, read a book out loud, you know, something along those lines so that your voice is there in a calm, reassuring tone. They know you're there. Horses have got an amazing sense of smell too. So again, you could hang up an item of clothing in their stable or on part of the fence so that they know that your odour's there and you're present too. You know, there are things we can do, um, you know, with horses too. And exactly the same thing as we said, exercise. Don't do fast exercise with the horse, you know, certainly after lunchtime on the day leading up. And maybe take them for a, a sniffy walk, uh, a browsing hedge wander, scatter some treats outside on the ground and, and, you know, and let them find them pop some in some cardboard boxes with screwed up paper for them to find so that they can do a nice calm exercise um, before their, you know, before the evening rather than, than trying to tire them out. You've mentioned medication. So for those animals who, which are really in a state of terror, um, tell us a little bit about the medication side of things. Yeah, so... Historically, we used, before we were where we are today, we used to use a lot of sedative medicines. Yeah, sedative medicines being medicines that make animals sleepy and they change the electrical state of the brain, they change the heart rate and the blood pressure. But that doesn't necessarily guarantee they actually reduce the fear 
um, kind of sensation in the animal. So different medicines work in different ways. So when we're thinking about dogs, because we've got the most literature that's been worked on with dogs from this perspective, then you really ought to want to be talking to your vet probably about two or three main medicines, really. We have something called Silio, which is a gel. It contains a, a drug called dexmedetomidine. Not that I expect any of you to remember that, but, the, but you might, some of you might be frantically writing down, well, I've tried medicines before, what can I try? The most recent reviews, um, which have been done in the last year, 18 months, have found Silio gel to be the most effective of medicines that were given to dogs for fireworks. Um, it's important how it's given. It's given into the mouth, but it, it has to go on the cheek to be absorbed through the cheek. If it's swallowed into the stomach, then it doesn't work. It has to be absorbed through the mucous membranes. So if you've got a dog who's quite difficult to handle um, because for a variety of reasons, then this might not be the product for you. If you can't get that syringe end into their mouth and put it here, and then just hold their cheek against their mouth so that they don't sit for a few minutes while it's absorbed, then that's not the drug for you. It's not the medicine for you. But there's pros and cons to everything. It doesn't make dogs sleepy. It doesn't have a sedative effect. It works on the fear um, generating areas of the brain and reduces the activity in them. So it significantly reduces their fear um, response, but without making them sleepy. Can lower their heart rate and blood pressure. So this is why you know, a vet will normally ask for a recent check to have been done to make sure we don't, we don't believe there to be any problems with their heart or circulatory system. Um, all the medicines that you're gonna give to a dog, a cat or a horse need time to work. You know, and typically we're looking at one to two hours before the first noises or, or smoke or change is gonna occur um, so that they've had time to be absorbed at that point. And most of them will last enough hours to get you through one single display. So for a dog, then Silio gel, definitely. We also have a licensed product called Pexian. Pexian is a medicine actually for epilepsy in dogs. It's a drug called imepitoin. And um, whilst that's not licensed for use in fireworks, uh, Lincoln University have done a number of studies now looking at its use for dogs in scary situations. And it can be used as a one-off medicine. It comes in a tablet form. Um, which they do swallow, it is absorbed from the tummy, this one, so it can be more effective for dogs who don't like handling around their faces. Um, and again, it doesn't really have any sedation effect. Might make some dogs look a little bit, a little bit spaced, that like they're not quite as with it as normal, but it's not a sedative. It's, it has significant fear reducing properties. Um, we have another drug called Trazodone, which some vets like to use. Trazodone um, can have sedative properties, and there is a little bit of a debate, how much is it a true anti-anxiety medicine? Doesn't work on the same fear parts of the brain that the two previous medicines, Silio and Pexian do, works in a different way. So Trazodone can work for some dogs, but you do tend to find they're quite sleepy with it. And if they're sleepy, it's hard to know if they're actually feeling less fear or they just can't move effectively. So, they're probably the most common ones that we use um, in dogs. We used to use uh, the diazepam or, you know, which is Valium and Xanax medicines. And you still can. They do themselves have good anti-fear properties, but they also have sedentary properties as well. So they will make most dogs sleepy. And the biggest problem we have with that category of drugs with dogs is that about a quarter, a third of dogs, instead of feeling sleepy and relaxed, go crazy. <laughs> they go ah, when they're on that medicine. Um, and so it's not the medicine to pick up that you're only gonna use on one night when there's a massive fireworks display. It's a medicine you probably want to have trialed in a week or two leading up to the event to make sure your dog's not one of those that has this unusual panic response to it. And it will wear off fairly quickly within maybe an hour or so, but you don't want to give a dog a drug that, like that, them have that reaction and now they're bouncing off the walls and going crazy for the duration of the fireworks display. Mm -hmm. So it's not that diazepam, um, alprazolam, which are Valium and Xanax, aren't good medicines or appropriate medicines for dogs during fireworks, but you want to make sure though the, the dogs we're giving it to have an appropriate response. That's what's really important about it. Okay. 
cats, um, were all a lot more complicated really, because we just have always had so much less data. But the medicine that's been used the most with cats um, for scary one-off events is gabapentin. Gabapentin uh, can be, has been shown to reduce stress and fear levels in cats undergoing something like a veterinary exam, you know, or, or traveling in a car. Um, it, it has quite significant fear reducing properties, again, without causing sedation. And gabapentin comes in capsule form, so it's fairly easy for you to hide in a treat and give to a cat if necessary. We can use that product for dogs, but we shouldn't by law, unless other products haven't worked, simply because we don't have that as a licensed product for dogs in the UK and many parts of Europe, whereas the other drugs we do, certainly Cilio and Pexian anyway, are licensed for dogs. And vets are supposed to use those drugs first before they move into unlicensed drugs. It's something called the cascade system. Um, so if you've got a dog that hasn't responded to those medicines before, then it's totally understandable why we might add trazodone in or we might add gabapentin in perhaps, um, you know, so that, you know, because we know that that drug doesn't work, in which case it's fine to do it. But the ones that are licensed for animal, the right animal should be prescribed first. And with cats, actually, we don't have at the moment a licensed anti-fear pro um, product like we do um, in, in dogs. Horses, a little bit trickier. There, are, um, there, is, there is another type of sedative gel, which is a bit like Cilio. It will cause some sedation, but it does work on the anti-fear part of the brain. It's called Domocedin gel. It's very, it's the same category of drug as the Cilio gel for dogs, um, but it does also have some sedation properties in the majority of horses. And again, it's got to be given into the horse's mouth and be absorbed through that cheek. And there are a lot of horses um, who are not a big fan of that. So that can be trickier. We can, but that's licensed for horses. So where we can, we often would use that first. We might think about if that product isn't going to work or you can't administer it to a particular horse because they don't like having stuff put in their mouths like that, then we might be able to use a product like gabapentin. Gabapentin, unfortunately, is not as well absorbed from a horse's stomach as it is from a dog's stomach. So we often have to use higher doses, but that's something you can chat to your equine vet about. What about complementary therapies? You know, I know you're probably going to want to ask me that and other people are thinking about this. Is there anything else I could use that's not a drug? If your dog is terrified of fireworks or your cat is or your horse is, please speak to your vet. These drugs work best. Uh, there has been a study that was done last year that looked at various drugs, various complementary treatments, various kind of handling techniques or touch systems, and basically found uh, that the drugs work best, particularly Cilio gel. You know, and that actually the complementary treatments, none of them really had any effect whatsoever. Um, and they looked at quite a lot, you know, and I think that is true. I think sometimes when we give stuff like that to our, our pets, um, it helps us feel better, helps us feel like we've done something. We hope it'll work. So we're more optimistic. We're calmer. And that rubs off on our pets. The calmer we are, the calmer our pets will be. You know, that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't try them. You know, and there are a whole variety of things from the homeopathic remedies to essential oil remedies, to herbal remedies, which can be tried. Um, but do seek you know, professional advice about that because particularly with the essential oils and the herbs, they do work within the body to do stuff. They do affect the gut bugs. You know, they may affect blood pressure. They do affect the chemicals in the brain. Um, just not as strongly as medicines do, and therefore they typically don't work as effectively, but you want to make sure that they're not going to have a negative impact on your, your pet and their health status. And with essential oils, both for cats and dogs and horses, they're super strong. You think if you open a bottle of essential oils and, whoa, how strong that smells. Well, remember that your pet's got a way better sense of smell than you have, and it can be really overpowering. So if you're going to take, you know, think about going down that route. And, you know, I think if we've got a mild to moderate fear, it can be helpful. Just make sure there needs to be the opportunity for the animal to move away. Don't put it on a bandana that they're wearing. You know, don't put it on the harness or a, or a vest. 
don't have it on their bed, which is the place where they want to sit. It should be on a cloth or perhaps even an open bottle that's, uh, you know, to one side that they can easily move away from. Um, but do seek, you know, professional advice on that. Don't just go to a shop and buy an essential oil because you've heard that lavender is good, because actually for the majority of animals, it probably isn't. Um, and it can kind of make them feel really quite nauseous. Um, and again, if you're nauseous at the time of fireworks, oh, that's going to feel awful, isn't it, really? So, you know, the, it's not don't try complementary therapies, but if you've got a, a moderate to intense fear in an animal, please speak to your vet about medicines, you know, as part of your approach. If you've got a mild to lower moderate fear, um, then, you know, complementary therapies, environmental change may help. Um, but just make sure that the animal has got the, the choice of moving away from them and you have sought professional assistance about them and the doses. Okay, we get through the, the main night. Yes. We've then got weeks of unpredictable fireworks going off. And then it settles down a little bit and then we've got New Year's Day, but we kind of, we, we, we kind of know what to do now. In, in terms of preparation during this period. New year, fresh start. How can we help our dogs, cats, horses, overcome this, what really is like a phobia now of explosive sounds? Yeah. Seek professional advice. That's the important thing. Work with a qualified professional. Ideally, particularly if you've got an animal with a, an almost phobic response, and phobic is where it's disproportional to the fear, like they'd throw themselves out of a glass window to escape the loud noise, even though the loud noise is not going to do them any harm. It's scary to hear a loud noise, and maybe it hurts a bit if you've got pain in your body, but that isn't, you're going to injure yourself way more by throwing yourself out of a glass window. That's what we mean by a phobic response. And absolutely, some animals have phobic responses to noises. Sometimes it's just uh, not just, but it's an intense fear response, which is in proportion to the loud noise, you know, that <clears throat> when it's got going on, but then they'll, they'll calm down quite quickly. But it's really important that we address that properly. And this isn't just about training. You know, so if we rewind and we remember that a significant, of do a significant portion of dogs develop these kind of noise phobic responses because of pain in their body, then we've got to address that pain. You're going to waste a lot of time if you start just hearing a noise, give them a treat, hearing a noise, give them a treat if they've still got pain in their body. You know, so it's really important that ideally, if you've got a you know, quite fearful animal, a phobic animal, that you seek assistance from a clinical animal behaviorist. And then we have organizations um, like the APBC, um, Association of Pet Behavior Counselors, um, and uh, the International Association of Animal Behavior. Um, consultants, IAABC, which have registers about clinical behaviorists, which are good places to go to. Um, it's not that your local dog trainer might not be able to help you, but we've got to remember there's lots of pieces to the puzzle. And the important thing is that we make sure that we've addressed multiple pieces of the puzzle before we think about training. You know, is the dog actually out of pain? Is the dog's gut healthy? Is the dog able to sleep effectively? You know, and once we've considered those elements, is the brain now ready for new learning? Yeah. And we, we would often start with learning some other things that aren't related to noises, other new things, before we might start going into noises themselves. And people often start thinking about using recorded sounds. They might use them on an app on their phone or they might buy a CD if people even remember what a CD is anymore. Um, you know, but that, so there are those discs that you can put in things. I mean, I don't know what, because laptops don't even have hard drives anymore to put them in. Um, you know, some of us might, you know, have such a thing in our house, a CD player. But, you know, uh, but, you know, you can put them on your smart TV, you know, all these things that play noises and sounds, but they're recorded in our hearing range. They're not recorded in the width and breadth of hearing that a cat or a dog or a horse hears them. So they have huge limitations. And that doesn't mean to say they're not valuable, but they're only part of a puzzle. So, you know, often when I've got a dog, a cat or a horse that's ready to start learning new things about sound because we've checked out their health, we've ruled out pain, they're sleeping well, 
we've done a little bit of kind of meeting new uh, sights and smells so the animal feels really positive about new things, then we might start with that. You know, a noise which doesn't bother them in the, in the slightest, but a noise is going to be the predictor of something good coming. You know, and we're going to climb up a ladder of noises and we're going to do a funny thing. We're going to climb up the ladder and we're going to climb back down the ladder and we're going to climb up the ladder and we're going to climb back down the ladder. And we're going to get them used to a variety of different noises, not just ones that are about fireworks. You know, and we need to do that in a very strategic way. And the kind of noises we use are very, very individual to the individual pets and their issue, you know, even when it's about fireworks because actually the majority of dogs who have fireworks phobias actually might be whistle sensitive. Or like you said about Teddy, they might be loud noise sensitive when it comes to, comes to a car door slamming or gunshot sensitive. And you know we want to, with this kind of program, we want to encompass all of that. And we should be thinking about what the features are that might be common in those sounds. Is it the whistles? Is it the pops? Is it the bangs? Is it the static sound behind it? And there's so many things um, you know, which can, create the noise which is an issue for them as an individual so that's why we have to tailor that pattern um, and I only mention the recordings because it's common for people to think oh if I play that if I get to January February and I start playing that every day my dog cat horse will learn that sounds okay isn't it and actually no that it needs a, a more structured approach than that it needs to be the predictor of something good not just something neutral it's what we call counter conditioning but equally we have to think about the noise itself because the recordings can be part of the things that we use on our ladder, but they're never gonna be the whole thing because they're not recorded in the same sound. It's not the same sound an animal will actually hear when a rocket goes off, you know, and that's important. And then just thinking about that, um, we didn't talk about noises on the night, did we? Um, things you can do on the night that might help disguise some of those noises. If you've got a very fearful animal, um, then one of the things you might want to think, I often, I now have a two pronged approach, if I'm honest, I think about having one stereo in the room, one speaker in the room, whatever, that's playing white noise, that's just a constant low for the ear, you know, that static sound, which is, uh, I mean, there's so many of them available, it can be waves on a beach, you know, or it can be low level thunder in a rainforest, your dog's not fearful of thunder in a rainforest um, but there's something there's what we call white noise you know like the sound that you hear when you're on an airplane if you remember ever going on an airplane and um, you know and that basically that has a, a very specific impact on the ear into the brain because it's a constant noise at a constant level and then you probably want to use some other noise some other music which has a regular beat yeah if you just use um, an, uh, um, Coronation Street or EastEnders, disaster, because they shout really loudly and then they stop. And so you get these bursts of sound, you know, which can distract from pop, 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 and then they go silent, you know, and then in the silence, guess what happens? Boom! <laughs> so, you know, you want something there that's a constant and, you, and it's better to have like a low constant in the background of not really, really loud, but it's just there. Because then, you know, when our music, our reggae, pop, soft rock music, which has got a regular drum and bass kind of beat to it, you know, does fade off for some reason, unexpected reason, there's still something constant in the background. But also it's about choice. Make sure that the animal's not shut in a space where there's that sound present, because if they'd rather go and bury their head somewhere they feel is silent and deal with it that way, then that needs to be their choice. Made me think about um, is it last year or the year before? Maybe maybe they're doing it every year now. But I think it was Classic FM, where on fireworks night having uh, music for dogs. Um, so so yeah, it's um, channels like that, can't you now? And recordings like that. But just listen to them in advance, and just and, and think: Are there gaps between the different pieces of music? You know, how long does the, the excerpt that you've picked last for? You know, I mean, obviously nowadays, if you're listening to it through some device, you can loop it and the looping normally, there isn't any change. But of course, if there's a fade out and a fade in, you know, you just, you don't want that to happen at the loudest element. So 
just make sure you're aware what kind of piece of music you're picking um, or what channel it is you're going to put on so that you know you, you ideally you don't get this yeah, there's plenty of sound there's plenty of sound oh it's disappeared for two minutes while well, somebody talks with no other sound because you can guarantee that's when pop, 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 will happen um, and of course if you're trying to mask the sound from being noticed then that's not going to be very helpful well something that you really made me think about is that if your dog has normally been um, fine with fireworks and suddenly they're not fine with fireworks, I now would be going to my vet immediately because I would be wanting to check whether there was something amiss that I didn't know about that's made him feel more vulnerable um, during this period. So that's, that's huge to have that bit of information. Um, so, it, uh, yeah, that's um, that's quite a big thing. It's big. And, and also just um, have a little sympathy for your vets because your dog still can't talk. Your cat still can't talk. And, you know, you bring your pet in and you say to me, um, you know, well, they're just not themselves. And I'm thinking, I need something more here. So, you know, it, it might not be something you can get to the bottom of in one consultation. You know, it might be you go in, have a chat. The vet might be able to do a, a general examination to check there's no obvious source of pain. But, you know, but, you know, neck pain, dental pain, pain inside. These things can wax and wane. And my, my son, as an example, you know, last night he said his ear really hurt. Um, and then he didn't mention it again all night. And then he woke up this morning, didn't mention it for half an hour. And then he suddenly said to me, mummy, my ear really hurts again. And we chatted about it for a few minutes. My ear hurts, my ear hurts. And then it never got mentioned again, you know. And I, I have no doubt, because he never says his ear hurts, that he's getting uh, at the, the start of uh, either a post-viral ear inflammation or, or the start of an ear infection or something like that. He went swimming at the weekend, so maybe he's got water in his ears. It's brewing a low-grade infection, but it's coming and it's going. And of course, if we've got a dog or a cat or a horse who's got a little bit of intermittent head pain or a little bit of intermittent neck pain, it can be really hard for us to find it. So, you know, just be aware of that. And of course, when a vet says, well, I can't find anything, you know, then that doesn't necessarily still mean it's not there. And the best thing then is just keep observing, keep recording, you know, as in like, you know, take video recordings, but, you know, keep a diary, is anything changing? Are there things that they can do that they couldn't do? I saw a lady just the other day with an older Labrador and she said, oh, the dog's just not right. Um, and she said, but that's one here. She said, because I know it's just not like her to, to, you know, she's just not right. She's, um, what was the main thing with her? I think she just, well, she just said, she's just not herself. She's, you know, she, oh, she's panting occasionally a little bit. Um, and, you know, she's just not herself. And so we chatted about, and I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, that's a big thing. Um, so we talked about various elements of the dog's life and I one of the things I said to her was and you know just a typical movement related question does can she still get in and out of the car okay can she still get on and off the sofa okay does she still go up and down stairs has she ever gone up and down stairs and at that point she said to me oh actually now you say that I've just realized we have noticed something she doesn't come up and down the stairs in the day she said and I haven't thought about it so she always used to, she's always been quite thingy. And so if I go to the bathroom upstairs or I go to put some washing away, she always used to come up and down the stairs. And she says, now she doesn't do that anymore. She waits for me at the bottom of the stairs. And she said, the reason I haven't thought about it is because she still comes up to bed. So when we go to bed, she still comes up the stairs. Now I think about it in the morning when it's time to come down the stairs, I have to call her down. Whereas she, I never had to do that before. So she's hesitating about going up and down the stairs and she's making a choice not to do it very frequently anymore. That's huge, you know. And I found pain in that dog's pelvis, quite significant pain in the lower back and pelvis area. So we've started on a trial of medicine for that specific pain. And if that improves, then we'll look into physiotherapy and other modalities to kind of focus on that area. But, you know, it, it's sometimes it can take, you know, maybe a few sessions or a few weeks and different observations to, to, to know, you know, what's going on. The same with gut health as well. You know, you know, are they intermittently being sick, eating a lot of grass, passing intermittently soft, hard to pick up with a poo bag poos. Um, and, and that can be really valuable to have a record of that because that isn't something necessary that can just feel their gut and go, oh, I know what it is. 
Exactly. And um, it's we I'm sure many of us who, who've had dog who have dogs have been in this position or cats uh, for that matter, where you, you just know because you know them so well, you know that they're not that you can't put your finger. On, and we've all been there. So I observation is is always the thing. Well, Amber, I, I can't. I just want to thank you so much for uh, talking to us on, on Pet Talk today. Um, I just wish you lived closer so that you could be Teddy's vet. <laughs> it's, it's, Teddy has a wonderful vet, I have no doubt. <laughs> I, I mean, actually, you know, I, I, I do love my vet, but um, I, from the day I first met you, I wished you were my vet. <laughs> Oh, well, that's super kind. So, there are great vets out there, but you know, sometimes we have to build our relationship, and COVID's made that tricky too, hasn't it? Really, and uh, yeah, but it's it's about meaningful observation, keeping a diary, you know, writing down your questions so you don't get flustered at the time when you go to see someone, ask them something. You know, all those things can really help. You know, improve the communication between yourself and a professional. Um, yeah. You know, so yeah, and just keep asking those questions and looking for reputable professional advice. That's the thing. But there's so much that we can do to improve things for our dogs who are scared of fireworks and our cats and our horses. And we haven't talked about them, um, but because so much else to talk about, but rabbits and guinea pigs, they should be coming in from the garden. You know, maybe tortoises too, if a few of you have got those as well. You know, think about those little furry animals as well. The rabbit will be terrified outside in the hut. The neighbours are having fireworks. So you need to bring that rabbit rabbit inside. And and also, I imagine that if, you know, if any of us have birds as part of the family, mm -hmm. you know, to be sensitive to them as well, because they're not going to appreciate explosions going on outside either. No, uh, any just, animal no, isn't are they? Nobody does except us. <laughs> Well, and how many of, I mean, I, I'm talking to the wrong person there because I am really bad with fireworks. I have a real um, loud noise, almost phobia. Um, and I've got better over many years by gradual exposure and pairing it with nice things and looking at the underlying causes. But I, you wouldn't get me at a fireworks display because well, I don't like the loud noises. If it was a silent one, I would go, it's the noise. So actually, I think, you know, a lot of us can empathise, can't we, with that? And particularly children as well, as I mentioned earlier, children whose ear structure or sensitivity, if that's the right term, really, um, you know, may be more like some of our, our younger animals in particular, or animals in general, we're not quite clear. They hear sounds different to us, you know, and, and so, yeah, we might think that they're great fun, but actually our children and our pets, our animals, often don't think that at all. So... Well, one good news in the midst of all of this yes. is uh, I noticed a friend posting on Facebook yesterday that there are silent fireworks now available in some of the supermarkets. Yeah. So we could all be, be helping by choosing to use those as well. Um, and, um, and so there it is. Well, Amber, if people wanted to um, read your wonderful articles and, or get in touch with you, how could they do that? I have a Facebook page, um, which is called Understand, ending in a D, Understand Animals. There's a picture of a black and white dog, a bull terrier, um, and some horses on that. So hopefully you would find it fairly easily. And yeah, I'll be sharing a bit more fireworks advice um, as well as the link to this chat uh, on there in the next couple of weeks so, to try and help more. But yeah, that would be great if you want to come and have a listen, um, ask questions, and you can use that page. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us on Pet Talk today. And, <laughs> and thank you all for watching. Do subscribe and like um, this uh, talk and uh, subscribe to the channel so that you can have access to more wonderful interviews. And next time we're going to be talking about um, walks with our dogs and how they enhance and enrich our lives. Until then, Goodbye.